Today I'm going to build an ass using the new John's Bow N2 case. Now Linus did a video on the N1 a while ago, and it's more of a narrow shoebox shaped case, whereas this one's more of a cube. Basically the same thing. They have ITX motherboards, five drives. They in fact use the same backplane, different shapes. And that's it. I mean, it's really just an updated version of the case and uh, it's relatively inexpensive for a five bay hot swap case. I think it's about 150 US dollars on Newegg. Uh, that's where I recommend buying it from. They have it on AliExpress, but it ends up costing more to the US. So if you're not in the US, it may actually be cheaper, but for people in the US, it's better to buy it from Newegg because it's coming direct from John's Bow Aluminum. Although there are some plastic pieces such as this front cover, which is nicely magnetically attached. It also has a dust filter on it. Relatively fine mesh, should work pretty well. And the openings on it are pretty big, so it shouldn't restrict airflow too much. The number one thing with NAS cases is hard drive cooling. 99% of them get it wrong and drives run too hot. That is the main thing that I look at when I'm looking at NAS cases. I did a previous build a few years ago, it's actually one of my more popular videos, where I did a four bay NAS with a super micro motherboard. That enclosure is not the greatest for keeping drives cool. It tended to run hot. Although you could put in a powerful fan, you end up trading noise for cooling. You end up with a very loud case to keep four drives cool. This one holds five. Five is kind of a weird number. Most ITX motherboards come with four serial ATA connectors. So unless you're running a SAS controller or you come up with some kind of creative solution to it, which I'll show you what I did on mine, you're not gonna get five drives out of this. And in fact, it actually runs six because there's a mount for two and a half inch SSD or hard drive, I guess. I don't know why you'd run a two and a half inch hard drive. You can run an SSD for your boot drive. These use the same retention like hot swap system that the N1 uses, which is a silicone loop. And then you just pull it out and then there's another set of screws with a little rubber grommet. It's not terrible. It's not very good either. So it's kind of midway. I will say I do like it more than most hot swap trays. The reason is hot swap trays tend to really restrict airflow. You need a really high static pressure cooling system to compensate for that. In a case that has normal cooling like this, having these as uh, open as possible is good. It allows for better cooling. On the front, USB 3, audio, and a USB-C power. Also on the front, retained in some foam is a little hex key used for removing the top cover. This seems so pointless to me. Why is this a thing? Why didn't you just use Phillips screws to mount the top? I have no idea why they did this. It's so dumb to use four hex screws for no reason and then have to include a little foam retention. Th like that seems totally insane. The back of the case is pretty well thought out. You have the standard motherboard IO shield and a mini PCI Express slot. Since ITX boards only have one, it's fine. It's a low profile one. So you're limited in what kind of cards you can use. There's lots of ventilation on the back and sides and top for the motherboard. There's no active cooling in the top half of the case. The bottom half of the case has a standard SFX power supply bracket and then a 120 millimeter fan, but it's 120 millimeter by 15 not by 25 millimeter. So it's one of the thin profile fans. Huge mistake in my opinion. 15 millimeter thick 120 millimeter fans are few and far between. Even Noctua only makes one type and it's not nearly as good as any of their thicker fans that are available. The included fan is perfectly fine. It's labeled John's bow on it. It seems to work well. I will say it is worth swapping out for the Noctua model just because it's about half as loud. This isn't super loud, but it is definitely noticeable in volume over this one. I'd basically call it a budget thing. If you have money to spend on a nicer fan, do it, but you don't need to. You can get by with the existing fan. There are four thumb screws on the back and this removes the fan panel. Now I've put this wire guard on this 
for some insane reason, it ships with two of these, one covering the back, which I, you know, I get it makes it look nice and it keeps you from sticking your hand in there. This one really just needs to keep all the wires from hitting it. You could probably get away without it if you just have your cables managed properly. You don't need the other cover. Definitely take this off. I have no idea why they sandwich it with two really high density filters. It basically kills any airflow. In fact, I'm going to actually try and just like move this to the back and replace this mesh filter and just have one the the round one and if you do that it'll greatly improve the airflow remember this is sucking and it's pulling all the air through all the hard drives so you really really need that static pressure and you really need as fast of a fan as you can get without it being too loud and having the the 15 millimeter thick fan i think just kills it and unfortunately because there's molex connectors on the back to power the back plane you can't get away with using a thicker fan they could have just made it 10 millimeters bigger and given you a bigger fan that just seems like such an oversight to me it feels like they were just telling themselves oh it's got to be this big for some for some reason like that's your target i don't know why i mean <laughs> i would gladly have a bigger case if it meant i could use a real fan in there the back plane has a connector for a fan it will just run it at full power the back plane uses sata connectors however i have confirmed that you can use sas drives if you have a sas controller remember a sas controller is required to use a sas drive but a sas controller can read sata or sas if you're gonna put a card in or your motherboard happens to have one which i don't think is very common on itx boards you can just plug sas drives in no problem even internally all of this stuff is metal so again, it's really nice in the case because it's aluminum. It's actually quite light, except for the fact that it has five hard drives in it. That makes it very heavy. <laughs> but when it doesn't have the hard drives in it, it's actually a very light case relative to its size. This bracket just attaches with four screws to the, the power supply, and then you just slide the power supply in. It's actually pretty easy to build in. SFX power supplies usually have pretty short cables. There's actually quite a bit of room in here to run your cables and have uh, any excess tucked away. Funny story, I went to go buy an SFX power supply for this. I've really liked the Corsair ones. I'm trying to stick with them because I already have the cables for them. And I already have two others that are the same series. They're all interchangeable cables. I like that. They were sold out of them pretty much everywhere or they were super expensive. So I started looking around and I found one on eBay, new, and it was cheap. So I bought it, well, relatively cheap. I didn't even realize they actually make an 80 plus gold version of this. The other ones I have are platinum or titanium. I think they're platinum. And I didn't even realize that the gold one existed. So when I got it, I, I kind of like looked at it and I was like, wait, this is gold? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a huge deal. Ideally, you would get a platinum one simply because the, the power supplies are more efficient at lower wattages and 600 watts, you're never going to pull anywhere near that. Even if you make this into something a bit more powerful, it's unlikely you'll ever hit that limit. What are you going to do? Put a 4090 in it? You can't. There's a low profile PCI Express slot. So the most you're going to get is like a 75 watt card. Because it's less efficient, it will run hotter and will tend to spin the fan up a bit more than the platinum one. It also comes with different cables. I didn't even realize that. The cables that come with this one are just generic cables. The nicer one comes with these nicer individually sleeved cables. Doesn't really matter. Cosmetic, but still feel ripped off. And of course, it's my own fault for not realizing there were two different models. Looking at the side here, this is the intake for the fan. It's filtered. All of this space here is space for wiring. Big gaps on the side. These are filtered. That's weird. I just noticed that the way the top is set up, because it's all passively cooled, you just have the air cooler for the CPU. It's just pulling down and out the sides. So I don't really know why the sides are filtered. I'll probably take that off just to improve cooling. And as you can see, it's got these stupid screws. Once the top's off, you can see it's a relatively straightforward compartment at the top. Space here for the two and a half inch drive. It just bolts to the side and room for an ITX board and a card. And that's it. I'm using a Noctua cooler. I believe there is space for a stock cooler, which would save you some money. On this board, which is an ASRock B550 board, I will put a link in the description for all the hardware I'm using in this, just so you can get an idea of what I used for the build. This motherboard is lacking the fifth 
SATA connector, so I've had to improvise a little bit. The motherboard, like most ITX boards, only has two RAM slots. I've just filled those with random memory, 16 gigs or something right now. I have some ECC memory that I'm going to be using in it. This is a Ryzen-based board because Intel doesn't do ECC. They're idiots. I mean, I know they're like, oh, well, then people will buy a Xeon or a workstation motherboard. But you know what? You don't make any freaking ITX motherboards with your with your workstation chipset and no one else does. So what am I supposed to do? I would have bought an Intel motherboard and CPU for this, but I didn't because you don't have ECC. Instead, I have an AMD 5650G Pro. I'll go over the AM4 product lines real quick. One, your motherboard has to support ECC. This one does. The easiest way to find out is to just Google whether or not it supports it or go on the specs page and it'll usually say ECC or non-ECC memory in the supported memory type. Standard processors, either like the 3600, support ECC as long as the motherboard supports it. The G series, like the 3600G, do not support ECC. None of the G series does. Do not buy a G series CPU if you want ECC. You have to get the G series Pro. They support ECC. The trade-off is that you get onboard video which not all motherboards will actually boot without a video card. So keep that in mind. If you don't have onboard video and you don't have a GPU installed, which you could just get a cheap low profile GPU and then just install it here, but that seems like a waste compared to having the little GPU on the CPU. With the G series, either Pro or regular G series, you don't get PCI Express 4.0. They're limited to 3.0 on all the different models on AM4. So you, you, have, you have your choice. You can either get PCI Express 4.0 and have to deal with a video card in most cases, or get the onboard video, lose ECC, unless you get the Pro one. <laughs> and Pro ones can be hard to find. I'm actually using the GE variant of this ship. So it's the 5650 GE. The E is the equivalent of what a T-series chip is for Intel, where they're just lower TDP models. I just got it just to be weird and different. <laughs> It was like $4 cheaper than the non-E variant. And they're basically the same speed and they basically idle at the same power. I think they just, this one clocks a couple hundred megahertz slower. It's, you know, it's meaningless. TDP numbers are all over the place anyway, so who really cares? I chose this board because it has two M.2 slots. One is 3.0, one is 4.0. This processor only does 3.0, so they're both three. The other board I have in the description only has one, but it's a lot easier to find. It's quite a bit cheaper. If you're not too concerned about having a dual uh, redundant drive, it's it's not a big deal. Uh, in most cases, you could just go go with the OneDrive model. And if you're running TrueNAS or something, mix and match. I mean, just have an NVMe boot drive, like a 256 gig one or a 128, and put a 128 gig SATA SSD. I specifically got these because this is going to be a remote backup NAS. I'm not sure if I'm going to be running VMs and stuff off this, so it may require, you know, like a nicer, faster drive. So I just kind of splurged for it just for the hell of it. There's a, a decently sized opening here that allows you to run all your cables down. The, most of the cable mess here is just from the front panel connectors. They're just kind of awkward cables. You don't want to bend them too much because they're USB-C and stuff like that. Do I really need to connect them? Probably not. This Noctua cooler is quite small and it's quite quiet. The only problem with it is that it has fins that specifically just blow in this direction only. So there's no airflow coming out the sides to get on the drive or just circulate the air better out through the case. I don't know why they didn't provision space for a fan here. You know, it's funny. They have space here for the two and a half inch drive. You can see the mounting holes. There's mounting holes here but there aren't at the bottom. So there's just two screw holes. So you could probably just put a, a drive there. I don't know why they didn't just put mounting holes there. That seems really weird. You know, I'd be perfectly happy if they just had a mount here for a 40 millimeter fan. Ideally having mounts in all four corners so you can just kind of choose wherever you need some cooling. You could put a 40 millimeter here somewhere to keep a PCI Express card, like if you're running a SAS controller or have one over here to keep your VRM cool or one over here just to help circulate. Options, give us options. It's not hard to just drill into the case. As for motherboards, 
depending on what you're doing, this is just going to be remote NAS, uh, just backups, nothing special. Depending on what you're doing, you could go for an Intel board with a, you know, a relatively modern chip with QuickSync, so you can actually run this as a Plex server. QuickSync is awesome for Plex, and it's like really low power and quiet, and you don't need a graphics card. So great option if you want to make a really tiny, powerful Plex server. You can load this thing up with like 20 terabyte drives, and you can have a huge Plex server. This particular build, like I said, it's not really doing anything special. I understand most people don't want to spend like $150 on the processor and like $150 for the motherboard, and then all this stuff just for a NAS. So one option is a board like this, which is the uh, Supermicro X7 SPAH. This board is a two core, four thread Atom chip. It can have up to four gigs of RAM, but it does have all six SATA connectors on it, dual gigabit ethernet, onboard video. And uh, yeah, they're like 20 to $40 on eBay. And they even have a 4X PCI Express slot. Very good option if you really just need a, a really simple NAS. This will not support ECC memory. You can just run, a I mean, you're, you know, you're just running something cheap anyway, so who cares? Just put in the four gigs of RAM, run a lighter weight NAS operating system, either, either run your own Linux install and, and set that up, or look into Zigma NAS. They support really lightweight installs and it should run just fine on this because it is technically a 64-bit processor and it's got fan headers and all that stuff doesn't ne even need any PS power connector so and it's really low power I think the CPU is only like 13 watts cheap option should you want a really low power NAS overall my thoughts on this are mostly positive I'd like to see them do a few changes in the future one absolutely make provisions to use a bigger fan get rid of this internal mesh in fact get rid of this mesh too and just make it more open. Who cares if it doesn't look as nice? Bigger opening so you get more airflow. Modify the top so that there's fan mounts on the top. Possibly, no, I'm thinking about it. You could possibly even do a fan here. Like even if it's a thin fan, that's fine. I mean, for the hard drives, that's no good. But even if you have like some kind of provision for like a 60 millimeter fan here with, with decent openings like these, I think that would work just enough to get air flowing. Ditch these. There's no point in having dust filters on this. There's no intake on this. The CPU fan is just pulling air down and it's really just circulating inside there. This is just going to make it do that even more. So absolutely ditch the, the mesh on that. Get better screws. Get rid of the stupid hex key. I don't know what you're thinking with that. Pretty much everything else is good. I like the, the decent openings. I like the magnetic front cover. I think it actually looks really nice. It's a very attractive case. I would like to see maybe an eight bay version. In fact, if you're making the case longer, you could probably make it a bit longer to the point where you can put maybe a sixth and the seventh drive in here. I mean, seven is kind of awkward, so you may want to widen it to eight, but even, um, even just bringing it to six, I think would be a nice addition. And it, right now, I don't think there's enough space for it to go back. I get why they did this. It's because they're reusing the back plane. <laughs> so they don't have to make a new back plane. So they're using the same back plane in the N1 and the N2. So I get that. But still, it'd be nice if you could have an option for a bigger one. And you know what? If you're going to make a much larger 8-bay one, you can go ahead and just make it big enough to do MATX. So you can have some more slots. There, are, There's a very common eight bay NAS that's available. I actually have one off camera right now. The problem with those is that the cooling isn't very good. I would like to see John's Bow make their own eight bay version with better cooling. They do make an eight bay version, dual 120 by 25 fans. That's what I want. For the five bay, a single 120 by 25 fan should be perfect. So I just feel like they kind of constrained themselves a little bit with this thing and it kind of hindered it. Overall, I'd say it's recommended. The way I got extra SATA connectors is that I replaced the onboard Wi-Fi card in the hidden M.2 slot. So I put this little M.2 E key to dual SATA 
adapter board and just installed that. That's why there's no antenna connectors on the back of the motherboard. Well, it's been a week since filming the first part of this video. Why has it been a week? Well, you can thank Newegg for sending me an open box motherboard that had dead serial ATA ports on it. One was completely dead and the other one, as soon as you tried to format a drive in TrueNAS, would just throw up a million errors and disconnect itself. So yeah, got a replacement, now it works. I also put in one of these nice six-way SATA cables that are all bundled together. Keeps it a little bit more organized. I had to cut part of it to uh, give it enough loose slack to connect to the uh, little M.2 SATA connector. Uh, one thing to note on this board is that it has horizontal SATA ports, so you can't actually use it in this case without little 90 degree adapters. I'll put a link to them in the description. They're like 10 bucks or nine bucks or something. And they just change it to 90 degrees and they do fit like that. No problems there. Overall, it looks a little cramped, but really it's not for an ITX case. Other than the changes I've mentioned, I really think this is a decent case. I would maybe like to see a wider version that has a push-pull configuration where you actually remove a 120 millimeter fan along with this. With the two fans, you could run it at a lower speed and get it quieter, and it would help with the static pressure to get through uh, all those drives. As for the motherboard, works well. The thing to know about AMD systems, if you're building one for Proxmox or any virtualization, if you're planning on passing through hardware, you need to know that the B550 and the 450s, they don't really have very good IO MMU groups. If you don't know what an IO MMU group is, don't worry, you're probably not into virtualization, but they have to do with passing through devices to a virtual machine, and you want them split up as much as possible. For example, on this board, if you try and pass through the SATA controller, it also passes through the NVMe controllers and stuff, so the, the whole system just crashes because it loses its storage drives. So you're kind of limited in virtualization with that. You, you can put it in a card and those usually pass through just fine. But if you're trying to pass through the onboard ports, it probably won't work. So you'll have to upgrade to the X570. There are a few ITX boards. I can't speak to how good they are. I haven't used any of them personally. They also have trade-offs in that one. They're like between 250 and 350 for one of them. And they also have fans on the chipset. So they're a bit louder. Pretty big price to pay for just getting better IO MMU. There's trade-offs with both, both platforms. Intel, I think, has better splits. If you had, like, let's say this was a 12th gen board, you could split it better, but you lose the ECC. Whether or not ECC is super important to you, that's a whole nother story. Did further testing with hard drives. I have five drives in here that are very hot drives. They're uh, mostly Western Digital Reds, the 7200 RPM versions that are eight terabyte. And I, I just find like eight terabyte drives just to seem just seem to be really hot. There's five of those in there. And if you run the fan at like default speeds, they get up to like almost 50 degrees Celsius. So that's no good. If you run the fan at 70%, they stay around 40, maybe 38 to 40, give or take, which is acceptable. But keep in mind, this room isn't very hot. It's kind of like average temperature. It's like 18 C. In the summer, if you have a room that's not air conditioned, the drives will probably get really hot. At full speed, you can get it down to like low 30s, but the fan is quite noisy at that speed. Again, this is where a 25 millimeter fan would really pay off. On that note, I can recommend this case as long as you know its little caveats, and I think this is a pretty cool build.